So, um, my name is Paul Phillips. Some of you, you might know me from such programming languages as Scala and mostly Scala. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I guess all my slides are Scala because that's what this library is, it's Scala. And this is the intermediate track, so nobody will allowed to point out that like a lot of this stuff ought to be all categorical and stuff. I intentionally set out not to just implement category theory again um, <laughs> for, for whatever uh, benefit may be derived from that or whatever failure. Um, so what all I have here are a bunch of slides of, that I, of demonstrations of stuff that's in um, this alternative library, such as it is. Um, I thought I was the only person in the world who ran with why don't, of course, why don't read that because it's such a pain. Um, but then I said that yesterday, observed it out loud for the first time, and right away, oh yeah, we do that. Sure enough, Quasar does it too, so good. Maybe there's thousands of you out there. But when you run like that, you get no namespace. So you don't have like, you know, boolean or any ref, um, you know, or int. And so you gotta get them all somewhere. You can either define every single name yourself, or you could use, you know, this, because I did that. So I have a big old uh, list of types, and then many of them renamed more convenient ones. You don't have to go to like import try success and failure from Scala util and import Gen traversal ones from the Scala collection, and on and on and on and on, and live with the random list of idiosyncratic aliases that are in Priya. Um, yeah, and I have no dependencies, or at least uh, not except at compile time, unfortunately. <coughs> so, and then as long as we're at it, let's rename things like gen traversable ones, which is literally the top of the hierarchy. So it's like, here's like, this is your shiny jewel upon which your object-oriented collections hierarchy is built at, what, 27, 9 character point. It's too long. That's why I should, I should have been like call. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> and since, since Scala perversely and cruelly prevents you from treating package names like names, it's literally impossible to, say, uh, refer to immutable in a way that allows you to abstract it. If, if you want to rename it, say every single file you have to rename it in port style not immutable to IMM or whatever it is that you want. But the, the end run right around that particular uh, failure of Scala is to rename, to build the name of the package into the name of the thing, as I have done with all the vaguely relevant types in Scala. So you have SCI map, SCI list, SCI vector, etc. And that's about the end of it. You don't, you don't even want SCI list, honestly. But for compatibility reasons, we throw it in there. Um, one of my least favorite aspects of the collections is that uh, they put size at the very top and it returns an int. So every, you cannot have a collection that is not willing to even buy or go into an infinite loop or uh, you know, give you a nice open answer on this 200 billion uh, link list. Right? It's, it's uh, size is something that you can derive a great deal of value of them just by being told what you already know, not by like, computing. So the idea here is like, if you know how big you are, great, you can return it. And if you don't know how big you are, that's also fine. You can say, I'm somewhere between this and this. Right? Like if, if you had, say, an arbitrary collection that started out as a thousand elements, but it was filtered, then you know it's somewhere between zero and a thousand elements. You don't have to do any work to figure that out. That's definitively the case. So then you can do a whole bunch of stuff like if you now drop a thousand elements from your filtered collection of zero to a thousand elements, there's none in it, um, definitively, and so on. And you can do all that very, very cheaply. So solving VI versus Emacs uh, uh, since 2014, here we are. Not that anybody I know agitates for one-based indexing, except then you have languages cruising around and bringing it out of nowhere. Look, one-based indexing, that's what you've been waiting for. You got it, nobody wants one-based indexing. But if you did want it, what we have here is either zero or one-based indexing at no cost, which is kind of cool. So there's a phantom uh, type parameter there in the index, but it extends any value, so that is uh, compiled down to a naked long at the machine level, but at the actual level at which we program, it, it is either an nth, which is one base, or an index, which is 
zero base. And so as you can see, you, if you try to apply an integer, that's meaningless because we have actual types here, not um, representations. Uh, if you try to apply one, the index one to that list, you get the second element. But if you apply the nth one, meaning the first, <laughs> then you get the first one. Uh, <laughs> Scala Standard Library does have some type classes, but they are used either not at all within the actual library itself. So then it's more like some student's idea of like, this would be a cool type class, right? It's, you know, the, the value of, of a library in principle is the way all the parts are like, you know, a cohesive whole. Either, you know, the left finger knows what the right hand is doing, whatever. Uh, so, not just to show, like, importantly, they're, they're, we're not as far as we'd like to get, but pervasively used to the point that if Scala wouldn't make it so difficult, I would remove the string and equals, equals, and all the methods that we inherit from any ref uh, completely so that you could not use them at all. And to the extent possible, uh, that's what we do. So we compare things with our long and clunky equals operators, and Scala took the good one for the uh, definitively inconsistent equality that is offered by any versus any. Now, whenever I mention empty, the, the category theorists start getting all like, tell me about the laws, and you know, I don't care about the laws. All I know is, um, like 80% of the time, if I'm doing a fold or something, I'm always giving it the same thing. Like, here's your value, here's the base value. Stop making me do that. Right? Like, if you can figure it out, you do it. Um, so, and very quickly, this became like super handy. I'll probably remove all the methods like head or whatever that are, you know, that can fail and replace them with methods that are presently called things like z head, uh, which I guess is on the next slide. Um, which requires that type to have something that poses as the empty value to, for the failure case, yes? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess maybe I was touching on that a little bit, but I guess your empties are not, uh, not necessarily unique. Uh, if, you're, if you have an empty index that's minus one. They're certainly not unique in the general case, like the collections would give you a fresh one. Um, and uh, for instance, this is also used for like building a Java list. If you ask for an empty Java list, it, it pops up a nuisance. It knows you're about to go and start mutating it, because that's how you build a Java list. It gives you a nice fresh one. So how, it, like, of course, an index, it's, that's the, but by type is definitively uh, you know, unique. But no, they're, they, don't, they don't aspire to be unique. They aspire to be empty. <laughs> <laughs> So this is where the category theorists have an aneurysm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm watching for the, the blood spurting out of their heads. Um, so for instance, yes, look, so there's an empty view, and then there's like, here's the thing. So we don't have an empty end, because what is that? It's not, I mean, like, zero is not the empty end. It's zero. That's not meaningful. There's no meaningful empty end. Right? There's a meaningful empty index, which happens to be represented as a long, which is kind of like an end. Uh, but to me, an end isn't even a type. Um, it's, a, it's a width. It's 32. Um, it's, uh, and so that's nuts, right? Those things can't have like additional semantics piled onto their big width. They're so, like, in fact, they are critical things not to have it piled on because that's where bugs come from. Um, so on the other hand, we allow the empty string to be the empty string. So uh, Z reduce is like reduce, except if you're empty, you get the empty thing of that type back instead of, you know, or an exception <laughs> like each And of course, there's, there's our friend Z yet, and so on. But again, I, I'm pretty sure if I get, like, I'm gonna get rid of all the unsafe things. That's yes? What you Z plane? Z plane. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there, I, I do have some other stuff along those lines, I think. <laughs> I think but Z plane is not, has not yet made it. Um, so, because of the way um, like the building and the making is handled, uh, everything happens for free. Like all the work is done for basically everything to happen. Because so where Scala went horribly wrong is trying to encode like the entirety of a view transformation into the intermediate steps, 
Whereas in reality, generally, you got a thing and it's made up of some other things, and you want to do a bunch of stuff to those things, and then you want to get something out at the end. But exactly what happens in the middle uh, is not that interesting, and it's definitely not that interesting when it becomes impossible for it, like it, to infer any types of that, and it goes nuts trying to figure it out and crazily complicates all your stuff. So instead, you just basically there's just two things. There's a thing that says this is how a collection of some type you know turns into a sequence of types, and then vice versa. This is how a thing is built out of a particular. And from this, all else follows. So like, you, can, you can effectively use, and my ambition here is to get rid of all the native collections, as it were, and to only use external types, because I don't, it's not interesting to me to write the plumbing on like vector or something, right? Um, that's, that's for somebody else to do. But I want to be able to use their nice plumbing vector with all my nice operations and have it work properly. And you know, plus or minus, that's what happens. As you may or may not have noticed at this point, uh, this is not to string. If we call it to string on that, we get something else. So I am forced to not use the regular REPL because it will, gives you no mechanism to do this. Um, but we uh, use our show, the, in, the show instance in the neighborhood for printing things in the REPL, which really makes all the difference for a satisfying REPL experience. <laughs> and so that's why we have all these weird, like, doesn't look like scholar notations on things. Um, and so force right now is the name of the, like, build me a thing thing where you say specifically what thing you want. And build is the name of the give me the thing that you think that I want thing. And then and then I, if I, I've got another little method that is like, I insist that you give me back the thing that I am right now thing. And that's basically, I think those are all the possibilities in, in real life. Uh, of course, you can always explicitly convert to some other thing. Uh, like here, where we have like two array, you know, it'll figure it out from there. Uh, since you're using show here at the REPL, I was wondering if there's anywhere interesting that you might be using your equal and hash type classes well, as a matter of fact, so I didn't get through all my stuff here, slide making. I don't know if I have a slide. So the, one of my, my least favorite things in the collections land in Scala are sets, which do basically all, do not function according to anything other than inherited equality. So there's no effect. So there's no way to do like all the things you should be able to do with sets. Like say, uh, like a set or whatever. Like if you want to attach an equivalence relation to a set, like actually have a principled subset of the original set that picks a, an element from each equivalence class and then like does the right thing and then it can be decomposed back to the thing that it came from. And all of this being done according to the eek instance that you supply um, as opposed to the one that it inherits. So you really got to work hard in Scala where you got the nigger wrapper type which now fakes its, uh, fakes its uh, equality, the, uh, takes the eek instance and so it's all, it's all matters. So yes, th this is where the eek and uh, hash instance are uh, designed for. Oh, and also, so the set, <coughs> the set type, when you call map on a set, this is always a, uh, a spirited conversation, what's supposed to call, happen when you call map on a set. Um, so what I decided what's supposed to happen when you call map on a set is you get like a map, right? So basically, because your set is a set of keys. So now you've got a set of keys and a function, right? And you get back a map. That is a map right there. That's literally what the map type is. It's, a set equipped with a function, right? That's what a map is. Um, that's it. Yeah, there's a separate function called map to set that then goes through the process of throwing away of values after, you know, basically it converts it to a set after the map. So there's a lot of needlessly, oh, I'm sorry, yes. So you, with the map to set, you said that you have keys to values and that it throws away the values. So something that throws away the keys? Um, like, I, I have the set, I run a function on it, I just want the output. Well, yeah, I mean, if you call map to set, you, you effectively, it's, it says, all right, let's build a set, uh, you know, fold, we're going to basically it's map fold the original set and lose our, you know, uh, you'll be passing, because you can't call map to set without giving an eek instance for the new type. Okay. Right? So, and then it will just, you know, it'll, it's going to delay this, so you get back a view of a set that will be the set 
that you'll eventually get after calling the function on all the things in the set and then throwing away the duplicates according to the E instance. Oh, okay. So you can define it depending on your new type of how it is. Yeah, it's it's right. It, it's all uh, nothing happens without like some eek instance available that, that determines these things. And then in principle, so an eek and hash are decoupled, so that you can have it like because you really really want a hash and an eek instance if you're going to be like doing stuff with sets. But on the other hand, where you only need an eek instance, the stuff like contains. So contains on on a, on my view type requires. Uh, a, an eek instance to say, like, what do you mean by contains, right? Like, what is the, the, what is the definition of, like, containing? And, well, this is the definition of containing. Um, so, yeah. All right, so there's a bunch of needlessly not that intuitive, uh, like, I, it annoys me after years that I still, like, have to think about when I call split at, which side that the, the, the at is going to fall to. Right? Like that's but that's really aggravating, right? So I thought like how can we do this so that that's obvious? Right? So I said split after seems obvious, right? If you have one to twenty split after a size of ten, I think that's pretty clear you're gonna get ten on the left side. Or if there are ten, of course, or fewer. If there's not, but I don't wonder whether the tenth element goes to the right. Um, and there are a number of like little things like this. I really like so grep is a good example of sort of the like the second order things that become possible after you have, say, pervasive show. With that pervasive show, that's just a nightmare of bug situation way to happen. But if you actually have a principal you know, means of saying what it is to show something, then you know, that's kind of nifty. Um, and I always find like, the, the fence post situations where like, I want to throw it away or I want to spam and then also grab the one that matched, that caused the cause of spam to end. I just find these things happen a lot to me, so I have them. You guys want to ask some more questions before I go stare at my slides again? All right. If I look suspicious, it's because I am. <laughs> All right, so this is another place with really good stuff. So Boolean algebras, hating algebras, I love them. Um, as you will also hear tomorrow if you come to my talk in the morning since that will figure centrally. Um, and the best thing about this is that there's no special, there's no, nothing's been put on function one. So this little and and here is finding the implicit Boolean algebra for function one and thereby imbuing these two function ones uh, with the binary operator that combines them. So, uh, uh, anything with a Boolean algebra has and, or, and not, according to the what's in the Boolean algebra. Um, and yeah, I like that. So what is the Boolean algebra? Uh, so I'm sorry, let's see, do I have a slide turn? So Boolean algebra is uh, the abstract algebra notion of the laws of Booleans. So it is effectively a type class with five methods. One, zero, and, or, and not. So, uh, every, so I know the characterization here of Boolean algebra is what's the dimension of the one you're implicitly using here? Um, when you say dimension, can you? Every Boolean algebra is of the form two to the n for some n. So, well, uh, yeah, but every Boolean algebra is of the form two to the n for some n. Two being set true and false. Right. So, but as I understand it, like uh, once it's a Boolean algebra, the interesting questions have stopped. Right. Um, it's Let's say you get into that. Yes. Okay. The the there there's also like there's also the Hayden algebra where we have more opportunity for interesting stuff. Um, but the Boolean algebra just maps everything back into the set of you know A's or whatever it is built around. Um, I have my kind of thing. So there's also like a a free Boolean algebra which is kind of nice for like, let's say you just want to keep track of where all your decisions are coming from, uh, rather than like aiming your way back into like your garbage collecting always down to, you know, it's like you have a space of one bit of memory, and so you're always garbage collecting whatever was going on and getting down to that one bit. But you don't have to do that, you've got lots of memory. So you can actually keep track of like all the stuff that happens and then, and then interpret your giant like Boolean morass after the fact. Oh, and then of course, 
we can also have uh, the Boolean algebra on function two as uh, so function. So predicate is like a to Boolean. Um, the relation is a comma a to Boolean, and these two uh, are combinable by Boolean algebra rules. So here we have like the predicate p one says a thing is bigger than eight and less than twelve, and then so if we filter by that, we get those two things, and then at the bottom here, and this. I probably shouldn't write thoughtlessly in Scala because people who don't do it habitually sometimes like don't know how this parse is so much nicer to read though. Anyway, P1, this that it's that filter and then all of this, point being that again the Boolean algebra is kicking in, but now on function two to combine those two relations and say that there's the thing. The only one that meets that test. People like me who are annoyed by the smallest things are, are, are part of how progress happens, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is very, this is very similar to what, uh, like I, I did a GL on commoners for exactly the same reason, because like doing case like x yeah. till the y, like all of the places really annoying. Yes, it's very annoying. Indeed it is. All right, so here we are, again seeing like our nifty little like show kicking in. So, it's not like there's a little bit of poetic license in what I'm about to say, like in terms of the actual implementation at this moment, but someday. Anyway, the, there's, an, there's another implicit, other than like all the implicit show instances, there's an implicit renderer, which is effectively a, an instance of show doc. And you can, in the REPL, you can basically decide how you want things to display. Like for instance, you can, you can configure how many elements you want it to show you. Uh, based on that implicit instance, which configures the render. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. You can also do things like highlight it or like show you in red the thing that has the property that's bad or good or whatever. Um, now, doc is the, the thing that show instances are, you know, it's like spoofing us up into, right? Doc is like this, you know, it's just an ADT that's like sucking up all the, the structure of a thing that was all like showing its way as it came together. Um, we use that so that we can't accidentally do things with strings. So for instance, Printlin and all the methods that do things like that, they take docs, not strings, or especially not any's. So if you call like Printlin with a bibby and there's no show for a bibby, it doesn't work. It doesn't compile. Um, you have to have some mechanism for, for seeing it. It doesn't, it doesn't just get like stringified and appended to the thing next to it. <laughs> No, I mean, that sounds like a joke, but any to string at is a real thing. And now here's the, 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 the feigned bit set gimmick. Um, the, the basically, the basis for the, all the complexity of the collections is you want to be able to call map on a bit set and get a bit set back. Um, <laughs> I, just, I, I kid, but not really. Um, so that, the, the, little, the little O method, all right? So that's like supposed to look like the, uh, he's thinking about it, right? <laughs> like, here's, here's what I'm thinking should happen, right? And, and the, that takes a closure that has to get you somewhere that knows how to go back into the type of excess. So when it tries, as a bit set, to think about doing that, it doesn't work because it's like, hey, man, you're thinking about it, but I can't do that. All right, that's your bunch of characters at that point. But if we go all the way and we're in, then we get rebuilt as we were. And 
And we do not have to, this is where scholar like breaks down. It insists that it be a bit set right here at the intermediate point, which is not necessary. I don't think Scala insists that it needs to be a bit set at the intermediate point. If, it says well, it wouldn't if you wrote it. You wouldn't be able to get it to the end at a bit set. Because what would happen if you did this in Scala is you get a, a set of cars and then you get a set of bits. If you wrote it like this, it, Scala would be more than happy. Uh, yes, yes, right. Okay, so, yes, so but the, the way that this is structured, it really it insists that it come back out with the same type, and yes. so Scala yeah, would fail. Yeah, you have this extra wrapper function. So yes, uh -huh. that's so right. What's the argument type to the lambda that we passed to O here? It's a function, so. Uh, the, the, he's thinking like, hmm, it's going to be u of the, the element type of xs to anything. Right? So that's, that's the argument type. So let's like, say xs is a string, for instance. Then the argument type of, of the lambda is view of characters to anything you want. And then the only question is whether there is a, a makes instance that takes the anything you want, turns it back into a string. And if there is, then it works. And if there isn't, then it doesn't. So O, so O is actually a generic mechanism. For, yes, on any. I want, that's, I, yeah, I want, <laughs> I want a view within this context, and they get right. me out of it when I'm done. Yeah, uh -huh. okay. yeah, exactly. So the, the method O is actually on any, you know, like the tuppling arrow. It's available for anything, right? Uh, and it's just a question of whether the implicit go into the view and the implicit come out of the view are available. So I, like, I'm not even entirely sure how this works at all. But it's <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so we've got the infinite sequence of longs, infinite up to 2 to the 64, whatever, close enough to infinity. Right? And what it's doing is it's repeatedly, it's, it's uh, uh, recursively uh, splitting, it's, part, it's repeatedly partitioning the set of all longs into, it takes the head thing, and then the sliver of all the multiples of that thing, and then all the rest. So what that amounts to then is you keep getting prime numbers at the head of what's left, right? And then so it's like you're walking through all the numbers, and then you start with two, you take away all the evens, you put them, and you make that a row. Then you take go to three, and you take all those, and you make that a row. And so that makes a grid out of all the integers in the form of it. And so that's basically saying like that's what I want, and here it is. So this is really mostly just supposed to illustrate that it does that without like. Now doing, trying to do it for every long before you can pull from both directions out of the grid. Right? So that requires a certain like tricky amount of laziness uh, but for, the, for this to actually work. And when I say I'm not really sure how it works, I, I'm not joking. Because whenever I try to change this in any way, it, <laughs> that's it. It's just frozen. So more work to be done here, but I, I like the test case. It keeps me very uh, careful. <laughs> Um, so the products are, you know, like arrow things are all going to be a type class, which is nice, like, because we no longer have to, like, privilege, tuple, means this wonderful thing. So we just have, when you try to do pattern maps on, like, arrow, and also on colon colon, basically it goes looking for, like, well, is this a thing that's decomposable head to tail, um, and is this a thing that, like, is slow? And if so, then, will split it or decompose it head to tail. And so that means arbitrary types like you know the Java collections are just fine for our purposes here and they effectively act just like uh, the Scala collections do um, do your match, whatever. Here's a swap function using the little auto thing. So that means in here we have a view of product int int and then whatever and then what we happen to do with it is turn it back into product in it, and we know how to build a Java map from that. And so when we come out the other side, this is great, here's Java. So covariance is like a real, uh, you really got to love any to think covariance is like an unalloy good. Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't personally, and so for me, that like most of the things covariance brings in collections is like but, right? And anything because subsumption is something you really want to control. You don't want it to be all like, well, here's the thing, here's another thing. I'm, like those things have nothing to do with each other. Well, let's just call this combined thing the thing with God knows what's in it, right? The whole point of a type system is for that not to happen. But that's effectively what happens when you have to like when you do any operation on covariant collections. It's like, well, let's just figure out what the super type is, any if necessary. 
That's why the scala for contrast, a vector of any vowels, the world's most useless type, is what you get out of this. And that's, you know, this is a pretty easy mistake to make, I assure you. Right? That's like not, a, you know, that's, that's hardly like out of left field right there. Um, but we are much more serious about it. On the other hand, we give up almost nothing because the immediate supertype of VEC is a uh, it's covariant, but it's an interface. It's a pure interface. So when you need covariance, it's available. Uh, direct A uh, is there, and so that's for like index types. Uh, but the leaves themselves, if you're going to work with those, are invariant. So the same thing, there's a little list where that's like two lines long, which is all that you need in your list, not the you know, 4,000 parents and as many methods uh, as you have in like inheritance land. It's sort of all you have in, the, in my list is like abstract thing, nil, cons, the end. Right? And then like the rest of it, there's a little bit of information in type classes, and then that's all. And that makes it really easy to do things like specialize it. Right? I've done that in the past, that this is nothing specialized right now, but because of the way everything is architected with like very, very shallow inheritance hierarchy, everything abstract basically till the end, and then almost nothing in the end, then it's very easy to specialize pervasively through stuff if you were so inclined. Um, like, you know, in Scala, you still effectively have no real specialized collections, and uh, yeah, it's not nearly as cool as it could be. Uh, what's the type of colon plus where it's abstractly defined? Um, it is a view of A's to a view of A's. <laughs> Uh, so it's just a it's just a method on um, and like this this is not ideal for sure like you I'm not sure what the right way to approach this what you want to avoid is anybody trying to fold over something like that right like well I'll just combine these things by by calling colon plus ten thousand times where I'm building up this like ridiculous viewy structure of this right but what's the what's desperately missing is some form of linear type. Right? Because to get out of this kind of thing, you really need to be able to have like, oh, well, I'm just going to fire a buffer and just start like, putting that stuff in here. Right? But you can't do that in Scala. I mean, you must have a more sophisticated type system that knows that this thing is only being used by me. And, like, and then I can, then, you know, that's really solvable. Yes? If I gave you a primitive for doing linear types, who, who did? If, I, if I gave you a primitive yeah. for doing linear types in Scala, the bad. What would you be able to do with that? Gave it to me, like came to my house. And was like, <laughs> no, I mean, like, it's like the, this is this is one of the glories of like the, the like, kind of wild west that is the current scale of compiler because I can literally just write a white box macro for you that gives you linear typing. Yeah, so having spent uh, far too many of the best years of my life on the compiler, I know <laughs> <laughs> that we can. Just, that we can uh, like glom more stuff onto the Scala compiler, which will do something like that. But that, <laughs> I've not managed to resist having any macros in here at all, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. It's maybe my, maybe my, I'm just you, you, you burn it up, and you just kind of cower in the corner and just try to make stuff work with like what's available. I don't know. I don't, I, that, that sounds like a terrible idea, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so you can answer my question. <laughs> Right. Well, I, anybody that comes to me and says, like, Let me, I can solve your problem, and all it's going to take is a white box macro, and they're, they're in danger of their, their life. Um, I, I, according to the nothing happening when I press the right arrow, that's my last slide. There's tons more stuff, but this is all that I made slides for. So, um, However, I, will, I could, I don't know, well, probably I'm over time anyway, I don't know, but if I'm not, if there's questions, or you want to watch me out and try to live any of this stuff, um, maybe that. I actually have a random question about this. You, when you started on this slide, you had some random like digression about the splitting thing apart for pattern matching or yeah. something like that. Does that mean that arrow in this case is not like just a, a, a type that has two members in it, but you're actually like taking advantage of the underscore one trick or something like that? So like, arrow is an object. Arrow is an object with an apply method which takes an implicit, which is the splitter. So with an apply method or not apply? Both. It's got both. Okay. It has an apply. The apply is right. and an unapply. That's, that's what makes a lot of sense. Yes. Right. So you're looking at the unapply here. Yes. And do you lose exhaustiveness? Hmm? Do you lose exhaustiveness checking? Well, did I ever have exhaustiveness checking? I don't know. <laughs> the, well, the arrow is product two, um, not tuple two, right? Like I'm, I, I'm not in the land of scholars. Like basically, I can't work with these things, right? So the type, the type arrow is defined to be product two, um, and so. Yeah, uh, the, uh, there's. I mean, so basic. So basically, the, the the interesting point here is if you change your collect to a map, you're not even going to get a compile warning.
It will just possibly air by happily Possibly. Air. So it's a, it's, I should check though, because the thing is, if the implicit argument does come in, then in principle I could be returning some. You, you should be And if I am returning, returning some, then it should get, then I should have exhaustion this checking. Depends at least on whether or not you're throwing away some versus none in your type class. Yeah. yeah if you're just going to option, you've lost it. There's, yeah. I, I, let's just say that there's a, a, like these are optimizations. I mean, I'm the only one using any. Nobody's ever going to use any of this stuff. Now, this is just for like my, my own like personal amusement and like talk material, I guess. So, <laughs> so I don't need, I don't need this kind of exhaustive exhaustion. <laughs> Plus, I find a skull is so dissatisfying in terms of exhaustiveness anyway that I like I, I'm no longer splitting hairs like that. Right? The fact that I can't do a simple enumeration that is that like not going to draw and really catch my eye. Yes. Are you still working on suffuse? Or will we hear about that tomorrow? Yeah, well, so like the reason I did all this work recently on this was so that I would have this for suffuse. Um, and I guess I'm almost, so there's actually another project too, so I'm kind of trying to get in here. But I also have one called, that's a Z3. And that's, so that's pretty cool, right? Like if you look at the, uh, the Sudoku solver in, in Z3 in Scala, it's like, wow, that's like, you know, that's how I want to program. You know, it's just like basically it states the rules of Sudoku and then says, just give me a puzzle, man. And there it is. Like that's, that's how it ought to be. So, uh, and that's part of what drove me in here and, and like made me realize all the problems with equality in general, right? Because Z3 has got this whole like little parallel universe of things like Z expression. So Z3 expression, Z3 Boolean, Z3 int, blah, blah, blah. And you construct these expressions out of these things and you throw them at the solver and then you're able to, including like functions and like vectors and stuff. Like you can do super cool, complicated stuff. But in order to like actually properly exploit that, I need like relocatable code. And I realized that all the type classes we use, including like the Haskell, uh, are not relocatable because they have bad Boolean. And if I could you know, right there at the back, the I can't, I can't lift it to Z pool in the type class. So anyway, uh, the, the Z three thing is really cool. And so all these things kind of they come to like there is a place where they all meet. Um, the suffuse so though that. Uh, what keeps me from really embracing that is the knowledge that fuse itself requires serious attention. I just cannot see myself really taking on like a Linux kernel pull request land. Like I, you know, I can't even take like the nice places. <laughs> but I, <laughs> they eat me alive. So I don't know. I, maybe maybe Dropbox will stop losing their minds and like apparently Dropbox just rewrote fuse and did but isn't sharing it. Thanks, Dropbox. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll have to see. But anyway, this is like this is foundational for one of those two things. The fuser is the user you can have. Anything else? Yes? So then for the for the Java map constructors where you're using the, the arrow table, with, is that then using that splitter uh, uh -huh. y essentially to turn into like, like, or whatever? Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, every like every the only way anything ever happens is through either split or join or cleave. Well, actually, it's not, it's not called cleave anymore, but I, call, I guess I call it like a pair or something. I like cleave though because it actually means simultaneously to split together and or to take to, to pieces and to put together, right? You can actually cleave something and join it, right? Because that's an amazing coincidence. But nobody knows what cleave means, so I call it something, <laughs> <laughs> I call it something more sensible. Despite the opportunity. So yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, exactly. So for this, well, you know what though? I, I don't know. Like these these arrows are probably just making generic product twos. So when you call Java map, that's actually just so at, you can you can there's a there's a function called lms e l e m s that you can make anything on that you can just like you treat it like var args just call lms one two three and then based on the expected type it'll give you exactly what you want so like all all of the things like Java map are just like wrappers around that same method effectively just saying like here's what that guy expects get to call me Java map and I should probably do that with like dynamic or something in a really good while. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like the, 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 there's all of this proves though that like the type class approach is is definitely works for like you know there's just no reason that we could not be because in all the places where you can feel the inefficiency of this yeah it's true you get it all back and stuff like being able to specialize being able to parallelize um, and uh, being able to like you know uh, fuse your operations and then only do it once and like there's a bunch of places where you get enormous gains. So yes, there's like, you know, there's inefficiency here and there, but you can see your spots and get rid of it. Whereas the big inefficiencies 
where you have this ridiculous, huge inheritance hierarchy are not pixel. You know, there's nothing you can do. It's a lot of stuff that you can do even further when, when you're actually interested in the plumbing, because when you have type class hierarchies and more specific collection types and things like that, you can actually have functions that you know do map without you know delegating down to iterable and like building yeah, and things like that, which turns out to be hilariously slow, which perhaps shouldn't surprise anyone. No, it should not surprise anyone. So when you're no longer like trying to randomly inherit you know default but very slow implementations, you get a lot of performance back, no. which basically for free. When you're when you're not trying to inherit implementations that are definitely wrong, but you need to override. So yeah, sure you don't accidentally call them. Yeah, see also invoke interface. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I like I don't know. I mean, I'll, I I would talk until like they shot me or something. And, uh, they, so so it's not like somebody has to say you need to stop because another thing has to happen. All right. Like because I, I don't know. So I'm like. Well, you know. so they they push back the keynotes. Do you have a talk after you in this room? Uh, I don't know. Yes. Oh, shameless. I'm presenting. So somebody is sitting there quietly waiting for you to stop talking. I'm not saying. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>